Good day, folks. Professor Fiore here. We're going to look at bridged amplifiers in this video. So what's the deal with a bridged amplifier? You've probably heard about bridged amplifiers if you ever looked at high power audio amplifiers. Very often these are in a bridged configuration. So the big deal here is that a bridged amplifier can have up to four times the load power as a standard configuration amplifier if we're using the same power supply. So particularly in cases where the power supply is limited, is a limiting factor, we find that a bridged amplifier has a huge advantage. Could be driving a loudspeaker, could be driving a motor, I don't really care. You know, it's just a matter of we're going to drive something and we can get that much more power out of it. So a bridged amplifier, it's called a bridged amplifier because it's configured in the output that is, is configured in essentially the classic capital H uh, circuit bridge configuration. So you think of a capital H over here and you've seen like resistive bridges and things like this. So there's five elements, right? Two on the left hand side, two on the right hand side. And then in the middle is your load, the thing that you're trying to drive. So that load is not referenced to ground. You know, if you think of all of the um, amplifiers we've looked at, the load comes from the output of the amplifier and then the other end goes to ground. In this case, both ends are being driven. It is sometimes referred to as a dual-ended drive instead of a single-ended drive because of that. But because both ends are being driven, that means neither end goes to ground. So we refer to this as a floating output. This all sounds wonderful. What's the downside? Well, basically you need roughly twice as many components in the output section. So if you're using a typical class B amplifier, you know, where you have uh, uh, an NPN PNP, you know, for a push pull, you're going to need a pair of NPNs and a pair of PNPs. And of course, if you're doing something larger, like if you have um, you know, maybe Darlington's, so you have a Darlington NPN and a Darlington PNP or a Ziklite pair or something like that, you're going to need twice as many. And of course, you're going to need twice as much as in, the, in, the, in terms of your biasing circuitry. All right. So, you know, that's, that is an issue. It's a cost issue. It's a size issue, spacing issue. Also, those power devices are going to need to be rated for twice the power and twice the current, right? Twice the power dissipation. So you got a little bit more work to do here. All right, let's take a look to begin with at sort of a standard kind of amplifier, class B amplifier, right? You've all seen this before. And if you haven't, then you have some preceding work you need to do beforehand. In any case, NPN up top, PNP on the bottom, standard push-pull, right? So for positive half waves, NPN conducts, we get current down through the load like this. And then on the negative half wave, the PNP conducts and that pulls current like this, right? So we get the positive half wave and then the negative half wave. Diode bias, everything should be pretty similar, right? So I've set this up. I don't want to deal with... Um, clipping or anything like that. So I've set this up for only a 7 volt peak. I've got 10 volt power supplies. So that'll give us a little a little bit of leeway there. And because this is essentially a follower, we would expect about 7 volts peak out. You know, not quite because there'll be some little losses, but around 7 volts peak. And so of course, 7 volts across the 100 ohms is going to get us like 70 milliamps peak, a little less. All right? That's what we should see. So Let's go do a transient analysis just to verify that this is doing what we expect it to do. All right, that looks pretty good. Let's get our uh, legend on here. So this sort of olive green is the generator. That's our 7 volts that we see. And then we can see the V-load is just slightly underneath that, right? In phase, as expected, this looks good. And then the uh, sort of... Kelly Green kind of thing here is the uh, current, right? The I load, which by scale we can't see. So I'm going to separate these curves and we can see them a little better. So there's my I load right there. Like I said, we were expecting somewhere in the 70 um, milliamp range. So there's plus 80 there. There's zero. So yeah, that looks about right. Everything's in phase. 
happy, happy, joy, joy. Okay. All right. So now we turn our attention to a bridged configuration. So again, think of item, item. Here's our load. So there's really three items of interest here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to clone this amplifier. I'm going to bring it over to the other side, like a mirror image. And then the load, this end is going to stay on this emitter pair. And then instead of going to ground, this end of the load is going to go to the other emitter pair. And there's one other little trick we need to do. The other amplifier, the other side of this, right, the, the mirror image of it, has to be driven by an inverted version of the input signal. Now, normally we would have a little circuit to invert that signal, right? Flip it 180 degrees. Now, there's a number of ways you could do this. You could use a basic, um, you know, inverting amplifier set up with a gain of one. You could use a differential amplifier and, you know, use that as your input. And then you have two collectors that you could drive, right? One is in phase, one is an anti antiphase. That's another way of doing it. Or a little further along, we could use an operational amplifier with an inverting gain of one, an, an inverting buffer, right? That would be very accurate um, and very simple to uh, create if you haven't looked at the op amp stuff yet, which I would kind of expect you would go through this first, right? Go through the discrete stuff, then do the op amps. But if you have looked at the op amp stuff, um, you know, because you like to eat dessert first, basically, um, the world is an unsure place. So you might as well eat dessert first, right? That's the argument. In any case, um, <laughs> so we need to get this inverted. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a little bit. I don't want to have to build a whole nother circuit and get this thing really busy looking. So I'm just going to insert another generator with the same specs, except its output is going to flip by 180 degrees. And that's what's going to do it for us. All right. So here's our bridged version of this. Right. So you notice none of this has changed. This is exactly the same. Here is the twin of it, right? Everything that was over here is over here, running on the same power supplies, common power supplies. But my load goes from one pair of emitters to the other pair of emitters. So here's the H, right? Leg over here and then over here. And then the little middle bar is the load. And I've attached a bunch of meters here so we can see, right? Here's the V load. And I'm going to use this as the same polarity. I'm putting the plus over here as it was in the preceding circuit. Same for the uh, ammeter. And then I've also attached two probes on either side of the load. In other words, what's the uh, emitter voltage pair out here? What's this emitter voltage pair over here? So here's what should happen. Oh, and by the way, if you don't know how to do an inverted signal, let me just open this up and show you. So you like you got your sine wave over here. When you set up your, your voltage and your frequency right below, there is a space in Tina to set up the phase shift. So I just set this up for 180 degrees, right? And it'll do it for me automatically. So there's like a, you could kind of think of it as like a, having a universal um, time base on here. So this will be synced to this. In other words, if you have just two sine waves, they're going to be perfectly in phase. And then you can just monkey with one compared to the other by throwing in that phase parameter. All right, so that's a nice little shortcut. Otherwise, I'd have to draw a whole other circuit in here, and that would just make things a little bit more complicated. Okay, so what should happen? Well, let's just ignore this for a sec. We know that if there's a positive half wave out here, there should be that same positive half wave, because it's a gain of one, over here, right? But over here, when this is positive, this is going negative, right? It's flipped upside down. So that means this emitter is going negative. So the voltage across this would be the difference between V left and V right. In other words, if, for example, we had the positive peak at 7 volts over here, I would have the negative peak at minus 7 volts over here, right? It's flipped upside down. What does that do? Plus 7, minus 7? I've got 14 volts across the load. We've effectively doubled the voltage. And, of course, power is V squared over R. So if you double the voltage, you can quadruple the power. There's your factor of four in power. Okay. All right. Now, like I said, this doesn't come for free. We'll look at that in just a sec. Let's just verify these waveforms. So again, I'm going to do a transient analysis over here. 
And let's get our legend once again. You see what's what. Okay, so we've got our two um, inverted and, and non-normal, I guess you wouldn't want to call them, right? Uh, signals, VGen, VGen inverted. Okay, so I'm going to come over here. I'll just highlight this, right? So there's your VGen. And then I'll click on this one. That's your VGen inverted. Now, on the left and the right sides, right? Right here. Well, you can't see it. It's just about off. All right, there's V left. All right, so on the V left and the V right, the, the emitters of those two sides, we should see virtually the same thing, just a smidge smaller. So I come over here, highlight this one, and we can see that's V left. I come over here, highlight this one, and we can see that's V right. Okay? So that looks good. You know, each half of this is working the way the other single amplifier worked. And then finally, we look at this. This is, in fact, the load, the actual voltage across the load. And we can see it's twice as big. So these are coming in, right? This right over here. So here's like 5 volts, 10 volts. So we put in 7. This is just a little bit under 7, you know, 6 and a half maybe, you know, whatever it works out to. And then this will be double that. Right, so if that was six and a half, we'd expect this to be somewhere around 13, right? 10, 11, 12, yeah, 13. So that works out just as expected. And then, of course, we've got the current down here, which, you know, if we separate out the uh, curves, we can see this a little better. So there's our I load. We can see, yeah, instead of being 70 milliamps, right, because there's our zero to 200, that's going to be sitting up, you know, somewhere 130, maybe 140 milliamps, somewhere up around there. All right. So that looks really good. Now we get twice the voltage, right? And that's, you know, I think, easiest to see here, okay? Um, you can see what the relations are going on here. Now, I did mention, besides getting four times, potentially four times the power, we do have uh, power dissipation increase and current increase. Why is it that we get a current increase in the transistors? Well, you know, basically, if you get a load current increase, that current's going to flow through the transistors, right? So uh, we expect that current to go up. But why? You know, how's, what's a way of sort of figuring this out? What's the logic behind it? Well, in effect, when you set up a bridged amplifier, it's as if each side of the amplifier is driving half the impedance. It's like this thing is driving a 50 ohm load instead of a 100 ohm load. And if that was the case, and I'll explain how that is in just a sec, but just bear with me, right? If we went back to the original circuit and said, hey, instead of 100 ohms, I'm going to put 50 ohms in here, what would you expect to happen? Well, the output voltage swing isn't going to change, but by Ohm's law, that would imply same voltage, half resistance, we would expect twice the load current. And of course, with twice the load current and the same voltage, P is equal to I times V, we would expect double the power. All right, so this half with half the load impedance would be producing twice the power. And because I, I'm doing that twice, we get four times the power. So how is it, according to my claim, this is kind of like driving half the impedance for each side? Well, think of it this way. If this side here, V left, was at plus 7 volts, or any potential, plus 3, okay? I don't really care. It's at some potential. This side, V right, is the same potential but negative. So let's say this is plus 7 and this is minus 7. Well, somewhere between there has to be 0. Now, you could kind of think of this as like a potentiometer. If you could tap off this, if you could get your voltmeter and sort of tap along here, over here, you'd be seeing plus 7, and over here, you'd be seeing minus 7. And if you were here, maybe you'd get 5, right? And then 4 and 3, and right smack dab in the middle, you'd get 0. And it will always be this way. When this is plus 3 and this is minus 3, right smack dab in the middle is 0. And when it flips, in other words, when the negative swing comes in over here, and we have a positive swing on this side, V left goes negative, V right goes positive. So... Maybe this side is at minus 5, and this side is at plus 5. But smack dab in the middle, it's going to be 0. And 0, of course, is ground. So really, it's as if this side is driving half this load, right? 
this zero up to v left and it's like this side is driving from v right down to that middle part that zero so it's like this is driving 50 ohms and this is driving 50 ohms it's just that you know we don't literally separate the load all right that's what ends up happening with the floating load it's as if the center was kind of like stuck at ground okay that's one way of sort of visualizing it if you could get your probe in there but obviously you can't do that so that's how we end up with four times the power potentially four times the power but twice the current and power demand ratings for the four devices all right so you don't get something for nothing it's, it's like all factors of two it's like well okay these things have to be rated at twice the current and twice the power voltage ratings aren't any different but the current and the power go up by a factor of two and of course the component count goes up by a factor of two so think of it this way you got like a factor of two and another factor of two and what you get out of it is a factor of four for the power and that's really what we're looking for here right now one funny little aside in days gone by in car stereos car stereos many years ago like back in the 60s or even the early 70s uh, very simple you know you basically had a radio and uh, you know the output on these things was just a few watts and if you got fancy you know you might have a a, a tape deck in there okay um, very often what they would do for the stereo amplifier is they would run only two wires to the two loudspeakers right left loudspeaker and right loudspeaker which typically would be on like the back deck of a sedan right you know behind the back seat six by nine loudspeakers were very popular they fit in there conveniently and you'd only have to drive you know one wire to each so you could just get like a pair of, of um, like 16 gauge lamp cord right which has two conductors and just split it in half you know if you were doing a diy thing one to one one to the other loudspeaker and then the other terminal of the loudspeakers you would just get a little pigtail and attach that to the chassis of the car because that's your system ground that's your system common that's kind of cute right it's a nice little shortcut you could do well you know nowadays you know it, it's insane i mean you you can buy car stereos that are you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of watts you don't do that very often they would they would have bridged outputs and you have to have two wires going to the loudspeaker all right just as you would normally do that in your home stereo all right so if you tried to do that same same shortcut for example Let's say you had an old, you know, like a vintage car, an older car, like, uh, you know, you had like a 1964 Plymouth Valiant or you had a, a 73 Cutlass or something like that. And you were going to redo it, put a new stereo in it. You look in there, you might find, you know, the loudspeaker and maybe there's only a mono loudspeaker in the dash. Who knows? Um, but you might see that little trick, right, with the, with, with the single wire going to it. Well, don't try to do that if you're going to up, upgrade this thing with a high power amplifier right that's bridged because if you do that you'll wind up shorting out one half of this okay so you just eh, not so good or if you just left it open you're only really going to be driving half the amplifier the other other half of the amp is just going to be sitting there useless right so you would you would have to run the typical pair of wires to it all right i don't know how many people want to hop up a 64 valiant but you know just in case you never know all right so kind of a cool thing you know we use bridge configurations in, in many other places uh, very common in class d amplifiers we use an h-shaped bridge um, so that's in one of the later chapters of the semiconductor book so you know this is not just something unique to a class b amplifier you can bridge any kind of amplifier really um, these are just some of the things you have to be aware of all right so big output power but twice the components and twice the current and power ratings for those output devices all right great so if you have any questions you know what to do take care and we'll see you next time